Thank you for joining us for, for the first of this um, AI and technical governance series. Um, for those of you who don't know Cohere for AI, we're a nonprofit research lab, part of Cohere, um, and we seek to solve complex machine learning problems. We support fundamental research and we create more points of entry into machine learning research through things like our scholars program, um, our open science initiatives, and our multilingual model AI and much more. Um, through all of our work, we engage in a range of conversations about the technical governance of AI, and we encounter a vast array of really insightful perspectives along the way. So this series is our effort to bring those conversations to a, a hopefully broader group of people, a broader audience. And the idea is that in each session, um, we'll bring together experts and leaders from industry, academia, civil society, government, and so on, to explore different topics from the world of responsible AI development, AI governance, and policy more broadly. Um, the goal isn't to present a particular position or rehash old ground, but to instead pick a single topic and explore a handful of key questions on it, bringing in the perspectives of people who are working closely in that space. So without further ado, my name's Aidan Pepin. I'm the Policy and Responsible AI Lead um, at Cohere for AI. And this week, I'm delighted to be joined by Arik Chowdhury and Steph Ifeyemi to discuss bringing technical and scientific input into AI governance. Um, Arik is the Head of Policy for Data and Digital Technologies at the Royal Society, which is the UK's National Academy for Science. Uh, he leads a broad programme of work that brings scientific perspectives to issues across the field of AI and data. And previously, he founded the think tank WebRoots Democracy. And in his spare time, he somehow manages to also be a councillor for the London Borough of Newnham. Um, Steph is Head of Policy at Partnership on AI, um, which is a non-profit organisation that brings together perspectives from industry, uh, civil society, academia, to address big questions on AI. Um, she also sits on various working groups and advisory panels for organisations like the OECD, Chatham House and the Council of Europe. Again, whatever spare time you have, I'm sure you're using it wisely. Um, so today I have three big questions that I'm going to ask, uh, the both of them, and we're going to talk through and a few smaller ones as we go. Um, and of course, we also want to explore your questions as well. So um, as ever with um, Zoom webinars, we have Q&A function. Please do pop questions into there and I'll pick them up as we go or I'll um, grab a bunch towards the end. So uh, enough from me. Let's get started. Um, today's topic, bringing technical and scientific input to AI governance. Both the Royal Society and Partnership on AI have excellent track records in doing that. So to kick things off, I was hoping you could each give us a sense of how you approach this. Why is bridging that gap between technical perspectives um, and policy so important? And how do you go about it? Um, Arik, maybe we'll, I'll pass it to you first. Thanks, Adam. Also, th thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's very happy to be with um, all of you today. So just a little bit more context on the Royal Society. We are... Um, as well as being the UK's National Academy of Science, which lots of countries have. And the role of a National Academy is to, uh, or part of it is to advise um, governments and other decision makers about issues relating to science. The other element of the Royal Society is that we're a fellowship of some of the world's leading scientists, and we've existed since uh, 1660, so around 360 years. And those fellows are... Um, scientists who are elected um, based on their contribution to their, their scientific field. It's a, um, I've seen it described as like the Oscars, like the Lifetime Achievement Award uh, for, for scientists. And historically, they've included people like um, Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, and today it's people like Vince Cerf, Tim Berners-Lee, um, probably most relevant, Jeffrey Hinton, Yoshua Bengio, uh, all fellows of, of the Royal Society. And the mission of our organization is um, to promote science for the benefit of humanity. And this really is the driving aspects of all of our work, especially in the, the policy uh, directorate. You know, it's not it's not just science for the sake of research or science for the sake of discovery, it's, it's science for the benefit of humanity. So it's a very active mission. Um, and our role in the ecosystem, the policy ecosystem, which is very significant. And as, as Ada mentioned, I, I used to run my own very small think tank. So I have two perspectives on, on how to do this. Um, and as, as a small think tank, it's very, very difficult to convene some of these uh, decision makers to, to think about issues because no one's heard of you. Um, you don't have a lot of assets or venue or building or credibility, etc. 
at the Royal Society, uh, where we do have those things, it's important to use that uh, in the, in these policy conversations where people are talking about scientific issues like AI, making sure that experts are in the room and experts are both contributing to the, the conversation, but also learning from policy experts, civil society, government as well, because these fellows, while they are um, you know, eminent experts, they are experts only in their own uh, particular field. They don't necessarily know about um, history or politics or decision making or organization, organizational dynamics. So we, we try to bridge that a little bit. Um, I can go into greater detail. I don't want to go into a bit more, but a, a broad overview of what we do is um, uh, investigate certain topic areas that we decide um, internally and approve by our governance committees. The whole organization is run by the fellowship. So everything we do has to be approved by our governance committees or fellows. We then uh, put together committees, which are usually a mixture of fellows uh, and non fellows, and we try to get a uh, multidisciplinary group of experts to steer a project. Those projects then involve um, investigating certain key policy questions, and then we, we publish the findings and our recommendations in a uh, report, which is a, which is externally reviewed by, by experts. And then we see that's the 50% mark, and the rest is all dissemination and influencing and, and trying to get decision makers to adopt those recommendations and I can go into a bit more detail perhaps uh, later in the conversation about how exactly we do that. Yeah, thanks Rick. I think the 50% generating, 50% disseminating is interesting. So I might come 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 back on that. But Steph, maybe um let's bring you in and hear a bit more about partnership on AI's approach to this sort of thing. Um awesome. Thanks so much, um Aidan. And also thank you for the invitation. It's so great to be here. Um even before we get into PAI, I'm gonna start with the first part of your question. Um, which was around bringing technical and scientific input into AI governance, because I think there's something so interesting about what we mean um, when we talk about AI governance and also uh, what we mean by technical and scientific input. So I think first on the AI governance side, I think it's a very timely um, period that you're convening this discussion with us and doing uh, this webinar series. So just congrats to you guys for pulling this together. Um, I think um, increasingly, we're seeing larger discussion, a more significant discussion about the role of technical and scientific input um, in an AI governance discussion, but not just in, um, you know, what might go into a kind of, you know, regulatory uh, tool or what's within a standard, but also in institutional makeup and design. So, of course, AI governance can mean many things. We could be talking about international agreements. We could talk about kind of the regulatory kind of legislative layer or, you know, non-regulatory um, instruments or tools. Uh, we could be talking about technical standards, testing and evals. Um, but I think this idea or this trend around specifically also um, institutional design and contribution to these various different AI governance tools, we've seen first in the idea of technical input into formal hard law to some extent. So um, I've had some, some good fun as we all have, I'm sure, uh, kind of diving into the EU AI Act, um, where I think the setting up or the establishment of this independent scientific panel um, to support the commission as they take forward the act, I think is a really interesting and um, kind of new model to some extent. Um, kind of having these technical experts advising policymakers very closely and playing a number of roles, including in foresight, horizon scanning, um, thinking about what the testing and evaluation ecosystem looks like based on their expertise. And that leads me nicely into this testing and evals um, space where we have, of course, the safety institutes that have come out of the UK, the US, the AI office and uh, Japan. And I think that that's another example where if we think about AI governance through what is an assurance testing ecosystem, what steps should you take before deployment, um, more and more technical uh, and scientific input. And I think in the UK, we've seen a really uh, massive push to hire kind of technical experts and scientific experts to drive forward the Institute. And that kind of rolls into all of it on ongoing foresight, et cetera. Um, I think that there's an interesting question though, when we talk about scientific uh, and technical input, 
Um, I think for traditional technologies, that might have meant something very specific. And maybe later in the discussion, we'll come back to other use cases, the internet, telecoms, uh, how are we thinking about um, governance in those areas and what it meant to be scientific. I think now we're in a space where I think over the years, we've kind of come to the importance of socio-technical input too. Um, and I think as PAI, and I'll now introduce PAI, um, there's been an important um, response to thinking about uh, the design, development, deployment of models as technical, also meaning socio-technical. So thinking about specific challenges um, and expertise that is coming from uh, issues related to uh, demographic data issues or uh, what discrimination might mean, et cetera. So as we kick off the discussion on science and technical, I just thought it was important to raise that. So who are we as PAI? We are a nonprofit, as you mentioned. We bring together civil society, industry, and academia. Um, we started with six companies. So I always, uh, I can never really get all of them, all six. But if I try and attempt to, we've kind of got Google, Amazon, Meta, Apple, Microsoft, and IBM. Uh, I actually got them this time, woo. Um, and uh, since then though, I think an important step for PAI was not just taking this from an industry perspective, but broadening the discussion to civil society and academia. Um, and our board, for example, is made up of all these different types of pers perspectives. Um, and uh, now we have about I think 116 partners across around 16 countries or so. So very much seeing this as global and civil society academia actually make up the majority of our membership, although we do have a number of um, key um, uh, AI developers and deployers in our partnership. Um, which is really, really important uh, to have that expertise in the discussion. The way we work is that we um, have a number of research programs that are critical to this. Also, I think, Arik, your shared mission in terms of making sure that AI benefits people and society. Um, and our research programs are really trying to narrow in on what are the kind of core components to achieve good AI governance. Um, so a few examples are AI safety. We have a massive AI safety program. Last year, we launched our um, safe model deployment guidance, which is kind of looking all the way from R&D through to post-deployment, what are the types of steps that model uh, uh, deployers should be taking before deploying their model. And that cuts it in different ways. Is your model open? Is it closed? Um, is it a frontier model? Is it a narrow purpose model? Um, we have a program on documentation, which I think is increasing increasingly important. The AI Act, for example, talks a lot about technical documentation. And then the last example is synthetic content. Um, I was pleased to see, for example, in the US executive order that there was a specific section, section four, which was specifically looking at synthetic. Part of it was looking specifically at synthetic content um, and labeling, disclosure, transparency, et cetera. Um, so that's a lot of the work that we do in our research side. And what my team do is really thinking about how do we translate all that research that benefits from these different perspectives into policy? Um, how can we on, uh, inform ongoing policy development, whether that's in a specific jurisdiction or at the international level? So I think it's very much about um, all those instruments I mentioned at the outset within a country, but also how do you make those interoperable between countries to ensure we have the best practice that is consistent um, in the way that it's understood and implemented. Um, so I can come back to a few uh, more bits in your discussion, but I think, um, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot more we can we can dive into, but I will pass it back to you. Yeah, no, thank, thanks, that's all great. I mean, I was, I'm tempted to ask you to try and name all 116 partners, but I think we'll we'll take the, that you named the original six as a victory and leave it there. Um, no, I think there's a lot to kind of pick up that's really interesting there. I think your point that, you know, governance, we're talking about lots of different things, I think will be a familiar concept to a lot of the audience here. I think I'm really glad you raised the point that kind of technical can mean social technical as well, and a big part of bridging this gap is also making sure that we're not letting the sort of socio part of socio technical fall behind. So maybe that's something we can um, return to as, as well. Um, and I think the point around international interoperability is very important and actually brings me to one of the questions I wanted to bring you in on a read, which was sort of the, the work that Royal Society has done on international level. And particularly the thing that's fresh in my mind is the workshop you ran a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, with that, that kind of fed into some of the UN's work on contributing towards AI governance. So how does that sort of um, 
international interoperability factor into the work that you're doing at Royal Society? Yeah, so what's that, what I think is very different and unique about tech policy more, more broadly is uh, the borderless aspects of it, which might seem obvious, but if you think about any other area of policy you might want to influence, so let's say it's um, uh, economic policy, you might be able to do, it might be levers you can pull domestically, or if it's um, uh, regulation of things like medical, um, uh, related to medicine or, or um, the NHS, let's say in the UK, you can regulate that quite locally. You've got things in place like um, uh, training, curriculums, qualifications, registers, accountability, all of these different things. Um, and therefore you, you can pinpoint exactly who to influence but on which aspects of those that you want to affect. Tech, obviously, it's, it's totally different because everyone is developing everywhere in the world. Everyone is connected um, globally and not everyone is on the same page when it comes to um, the issues we might consider to be a problem and, and others just might not consider it to be a problem at all. So this makes it very difficult and when you're, uh, you know, a London-based organisation, you are often... Yeah, obviously very important stuff happening in London, but also it's important stuff happening in DC, in Brussels, and in Beijing. So we do try our best to do some influencing in, in that respect. And the Royal Society is very well connected globally. So we've done um, in the past six months, we've done work um, in the US. We did a, a forum with the US National Academy of Science on research and access to data, which has a lot of relevance here because we want to understand. If you want to have accountability, you often need to know what's going into these models and, and how they're being trained. And access is very difficult, not just in terms of governance, but in terms of uh, technical access, the size of these data sets, um, the formats, where they're being held, commercial sensitivities, etc. And we've just published um, the summary report of that. If you search, uh, if you search Royal Society, National Academy of Science, research access to data, you'll probably find it. Um, we've also um, we also did a workshop with the Chinese Academy of Science in Beijing, looking at AI ethics. And this was a much more high level conversation, but it was looking in particular at the use of AI in science and sort of exchanging um, knowledge and approaches between uh, UK and Chinese uh, AI uh, researchers. And we've also done a little bit of work in, in uh, or a little bit of engagement in Brussels um, regarding what's happening post uh, the AI Act. So it's very, very important that we, we do all of that because if you're just producing content and advice for the UK uh, government or UK decision makers, you're not really going to affect that that wider landscape. And I'm sure you're, from your experience at the Ada Lovelace Institute, and I'm sure you probably had a, a similar experience of, of needing to influence all these different types of actors. I forgot what your original question was. Then, <laughs> that's the thing. No, no, it's all, it's all, it's all missed, yeah. the, 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 Oh, sorry, the, the UN workshop. I, I yeah. missed out. So we, um, the the UN uh, has a high level advisory body that's trying to consider how to govern AI globally. Um, obviously, the UN is a very high level body, and a, a bit like the Royal Society, actually, they are more of a convener. Um, the huge benefit of the UN is that there's 194 countries who signed up to it. Uh, so there are 194 countries who should be paying attention and they've got relationships with the UN and they can also disseminate outputs to decision makers across the world. So this is very, very much an important um, stakeholder to influence no matter what people's views are in terms of their efficacy. Um, so they published an interim report and we uh, decided to try and influence that by convening a um, workshop, so workshop of both scientific experts, AI researchers and, and members of our, our fellowship but also civil society, um, you know, tra trade union voices in the room. Uh, you know, it's very, it's very important to you know, regulators, government, etc. Very important to have those people in the room because, like I said earlier, the people developing these technologies don't necessarily know how they're going to be used in practice, um, or how the organisations will work, or what the um, needs and potential flaws will be, or what the potential ethical the challenges might be or what historically has been has been ethical challenges in the past you know some of these problems are new but some of them aren't you know if you 
a good example I tried to think of in my own mind is um, to bring it back to like roads and cars. So like governance and the law, they are two levers that might help achieve your goal, which might be um, AI safety or you know preventing deep fakes being produced or whatever. But they are only two aspects of it. If you look at how we prevent accidents on roads, we've got um, you know training, uh, driving tests, uh, tests for cyclists. Um, uh, we we teach children how to cross the road. Um, we, we try to educate pedestrians. We've got pavements uh, to separate out traffic, um, the rules of the road, licenses, no licenses for some uh, road users, traffic lights, fines, points on your license, engineering, safety seatbelts, um, insurance, uh, locks on your door, regulation of petrol pumps, notification lights on your vehicle. Um, so many different aspects of it. <laughs> yeah, so many, so many different aspects of it, right, of which governance and the law are just two elements of it. So um, trying to bring together people who have a, a broad understanding of of what the equivalents might be for AI is, is a really important thing that we tried to do um, a lot. And we tried to do a little bit in the, in the recent workshop on AI governance, but you can also read a, a note of if you search um, the United Nations role in international AI governance, Royal Society, you'll be able to find um, the note of that that workshop as well. I, I, I'm I'm kind of really glad you brought up the like roads and cars framing because I think it's it's useful for thinking about so I, I think one of the one of the tendencies and this sort of is leading into the, the next big question that I wanted to cover in this one of the tendencies I think when we're talking about AI is because it's a very nascent technology with very novel capabilities we sort of think that therefore all the ways we approach the policy and governance of it has to be equally nascent and novel but actually there are kind of existing frameworks we can think about and use and I think thinking about where we have, um, for example, yeah, regulatory frameworks or, or safety frameworks around roads is really useful because we we don't think of that as being something that's incredibly complex because we all interact with roads and cars and vehicles every single day. Many of us have driving license, et cetera. We have frameworks which work globally and nationally, et cetera. But none of those things sprang up overnight. They sprang up over decades of work and the development of the technology you know when cars were first built there weren't any road markings road markings came in decades later to stop accidents you know had, forcing people to drive on one side of the road or the other you know all these sorts of things seat belts etc and i think i'm i find it really interesting that um you know it's important for us to think about individual kind of technical solutions such as a seatbelt or an airbag it's important for us to think about single policy interventions like speed limits or licensing or whatever um but but sometimes i think we forget when we're just looking oh we need this holistic framework we forget that actually individual interventions on policy or technical approaches will add up over time and it's how do we do that in a coordinated and speedy way so with that preamble let's maybe turn to sort of the next question which is exactly that how can we how can those of us working in the space of AI governance and policy learn from previous um, efforts to, to bring in governance for other technical spaces, whether they're relatively low tech as cars maybe feel now or kind of more high tech, such as nuclear or aviation? Um, Steph, I maybe come to, come to you on that first. Like, how do you think about ways that we can learn from other areas of techno scientific policy? Awesome. Um, and I agree with you actually on that point, Ada, that I think I think sometimes we forget that all of this has to come back together at some point and work uh, work seamlessly to some extent within countries, across countries. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something that keeps me up at night sometimes, I think. Um, I don't know if I should also publicly shame myself, as you mentioned, uh, driver's license. I was like, I actually don't have a driver's license. I don't know if I should actually <laughs> share this on something that's going on YouTube um but yeah i think all of these i think as long as you're not you're not driving cars without a license i think it's okay <laughs> yeah, to admit you don't have a that's license true. <laughs> um yeah no um but yeah all those points um i think really come together nicely and i think that's a great example um and i think it's a reminder of the fact that uh yeah past technologies um and questions uh uh, use cases are really, really example, uh, are really, really important, sorry. Um, AI might exacerbate some of the existing challenges that we have. And I have a few thoughts on where that 
might be the case and where we still might need to readapt some of our existing systems to respond to maybe some of the specific um, pinpoints that we've identified. But fundamentally, there are institutions and foundations that we can learn from. So uh, two areas actually that come to mind are telecoms and medical devices for me. Um, but I think that's also me being a standards geek and coming very much from a kind of technical standards background uh, and two areas where I think we have a pretty uh, strong kind of uh, standards ecosystem. So in terms of what I mean by technical standards is a kind of governance area and tool. Um, these are standards um, that are developed at largely um, international uh, standards development organizations. So ISO, the International Standards Organization is one. In Europe, you have Senelec. Um, in the US, you have um, ANSI. People often forget about ANSI as actually the America's National Standards Body, but you also have NIST to do a lot of uh, standards work too. Um, but what do they do? They are um, they're essentially meant to set out best practice and do what you mentioned, Aiden, make things work together consistently. They build shared language and allow us to kind of apply and test uh, for good tests that something has achieved good practice and it's robust. Um, and so one is a type of foundational standard, for example, these help build common understanding in telecoms and in medical devices. Terminology, it helps to make things less ambiguous. You have metrology and measurement, um, which uh, help put quantitative measurement behind the kind of foundational standards. And I think that's a kind of going back to that kind of technical and scientific role. That's actually really, really critical. And I know in the UK, we have NPL, the National Physical Laboratory, and in the US, you have NIST who do a lot of that research work. And then process standards. So um, I think this is where a lot of uh, organizations come into the fold because process standards, such as kind of organizational management, risk management tools, are what underpin audits, risk and quality management processes. Um, so that also potentially leads to things like certification. So I think what we've seen, at least in the telecoms and the medical devices space, is that over time we had a very sophisticated and kind of step-by-step -step process for how we would think about um, what we needed from standards and then how you move from kind of the foundational stage to the kind of process and certification stage. Um, of course, not perfect. Uh, but I think what we saw from kind of 3G to 4G, 5G, and before I uh, left government, discussions about 6G already in terms of standards, even thinking ahead about the standards you need for the next generation, is um, there was a process also for updating them. Of course, AI brings about the question of speed. Uh, you don't actually have maybe a few years to think about the next uh, deployment um, and therefore the need for the next set of standards. So that's, I think, one example of the potential um, uh, challenge that AI in itself uh, brings when we think about um, old examples. Um, so those are two areas that I think are, are really interesting for us to come back to. Um, and uh, I think we've seen, or we are starting to see in policy frameworks, um, us trying to understand what the specific challenges that AI introduces, whether that's speed, um, one question, or we hosted um, an AI forum, policy forum at the end of last year. And one interesting point was how do you reissue certification at speed that came up? So, for example, um, maybe in the telecom space, you go through your standard, you get a certification, you get that trust mark in Europe, that might be that CE mark. Um, and then how do you potentially re-update the test um, reissue the certification kind of trust mark at speed. I think that that's one challenge. If we've traditionally relied on standards, um, uh, AI terminology is another example I'll quickly give. So AI safety. Um, a few years ago when I was working in um, government, we had a set definition of AI safety actually, and NIST actually had um, a really good framework under their risk management framework for different facets of what we call AI trustworthiness at the time, and AI safety was one component of that. AI safety today, particularly in the policy space, means many different things to many different people, and it has almost adopted an umbrella term definition that is traditionally what we would have called like responsible AI or trustworthiness. It's just it's almost everything. Yeah. Now, and before that, it was AI ethics, right? <laughs> exactly. And so I think the challenge is that 
language in the way that it was easy, we would formalize it and lock it in and we had a shared expectation of what something meant and then you would move into kind of metrology for understanding something it's just kind of shifting and you're coming have you have this cycle of at that foundational stage that we haven't locked down so that's one um additional challenge as well um and then i think the last uh point in was maybe institutional that we're seeing different so before we had maybe like the standards bodies um doing a lot of work and just another example going back to the safety institutes there's a kind of new role at the pre-standardization stage that we've set up to kind of do research at pace at least from what you know it's still very much in development right but you have this pre-standardization phase of quick research that is meant to then move into the standards uh to uh, institutions to kind of formalize. But to some extent, some of the standards bodies also aren't ready for that shift. So we've moved fast to set up these pre-standards institutions. But if you just look at some of the work and some of the standards bodies at the moment, a lot of them um, prefer to focus on use cases, so kind of vertical standards and less at the kind of horizontal foundation model level. And so even if we are able to kind of get the work in the, you know, the US Safety Institute Consortium under NIST or in the UK, how do you begin to formalize it? And again, avoid this challenge we've had when you just think about safety and how it's gone through different cycles. So a few um, problem statements there. And Eric is of course gonna solve all of them when he wants <laughs> the question too. But I do think that there are some things we can learn from and probably solutions that we've tapped into before that um, we could revisit. Eric, did you did you want to take the challenge and try and solve all these these problems? The, the solution is no. Um, I saw Natalie's asked a, a question in the chat about the the driving analogy, which is a good one about the pace being uh, very different. And I think this is the 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 real really big challenge with AI is just how fast um, it is developing. And whilst the sort of formal institutions like government standards bodies etc are going to be a really important aspect of that a big part of it still is ensuring that the companies themselves uh, behave in a responsible manner and if you look at the past you know 12 months two years you know there, there are huge question marks over whether some of these models have been released responsibly thinking about um you know applications like disinformation and deep fakes these, these aren't new issues that people are talking about and one one other thing i did before before i joined the royal society um in 2019 i led a project to produce um deep fakes of boris johnson and jeremy corbyn endorsing each other to become prime minister and then warning the the public um about the, the coming age of deep fakes etc and the need to regulate uh, which is viewed by millions of people you know lots of um, governments and companies such are working um engaging with it but did anything happen in the in the in those five years realistically? No, not really, right? Nothing. I mean, there's some some slow progress on on things like content provenance, and we we've looked at this at the Royal Society. This is a, the idea that you could um, track how content um, has been manipulated as as that piece of content travels up throughout the internet. So if it's an image, it would be you know it's taken on this device at this time, um, and these are these are the manipulations that we made to it and again just to, to plug some more of our work if you search um royal society bbc content provenance you'll see our our note on that but that you know that that's a technical solution that a lot of companies are working on but it's very limited you know it's um there's so many so many flaws to it um does it really solve the issue of this information does it only work if certain companies sign up what about people who don't sign up I can't remember its name, but someone I was talking to recently said that there's a there's a chat GPT without guardrails, you know, that people are just going to produce the stuff irresponsibly. Um, another good comparison is the social media uh, online harms um, regulation debate, which in the UK took se several years for from the beginning of the debate to the passing of the Online Safety Act. And in that time, by the time that the the Online Safety Act was passed, the types of harms that people are talking about were just very different to the beginning, right? Um, you know, at one, at one point, um, 
you know, it was possible for researchers to access data on Twitter and, and by the end of it, you know, there's, there's huge paywalls, paywalls for it, for example. Um, you know, there are people who um, will go to bed tonight crying because they've been made into a, a, a deep fake CSAM image. And so there's lots, lots of things that have not been solved yet or not been solved quickly enough, which is why it's really important to to always think about who are those other actors who can play a role. So we did a report uh, two years ago called the Online Information Environment, which which focused on the challenge, that primarily focused on scientific disinformation, but also looked at AI-generated disinformation. And, and one solution, one recommendation we put forward, which pretty much every report ever on this topic puts forward, is to invest in information literacy, this idea that you should accept that this problem is going to evolve and it's going to evolve faster than we can regulate it or develop technical solutions and just equip the population to be able to identify it, understand it, know how to approach it, know how to report it. And there's been no no real investment in that. If you look around the world, I don't think there's been any real um, investment in that. And even that solution is basically saying, you know, libraries and teachers in one corner versus, you know, huge tech companies and state actors in the other. So it's, it can be an uphill uphill battle. So the, the solutions have to be across each of those different elements, um, technical, societal, education, uh, legal. And when we do all of our reports in these areas, we try to think of those uh, individually as well. Again, it's the, it's the socio-technical as well as, as the technical. And often, I think, to the point of libraries and teachers against big tech companies, you know, when... When a when a when a platform has two million users and can roll out an update overnight, that's much more difficult than the kind of slower pace of some of these other things as well. Which I think is another point on the question around the challenge of pace, which also neatly kind of addresses one of the things I wanted to ask, which is where do some of these like metaphors and thinking about other social technical things fall apart and whether they not help us? And I think the pace of change and the scale of change is probably the big one here. But Steph, did did you want to come in? Yeah, um, just wanted to respond to some of the great points that um, Arik flagged um, and this, I think, synthetic content is a really, really good example. We um, recently just held an event in New York uh, and one of the events that we had or the panels we had was on AI in elections. And I think this is definitely the year where there's a lot more policy discussion about the risk related to synthetic content. But I think Arik, you flag an important point about the fact that the information ecosystem wasn't necessarily perfect before we had the rollout of deepfakes and almost our electoral uh, systems. Um, and so trying to almost like disaggregate what AI exacerbates and really thinking about the baseline of like, what were the challenges we had before and what is the specific um, additional risk posed through to the, the deployment of uh, AI or a specific deepfake, for example. Um, but something that we um, have done recently, um, led by our media AI media integrity team, is uh, one product was an AI disclosure and transparency glossary. I think it's trying to do some of that more technical scientific work to break down what are the different types of disclosure uh, mechanisms and techniques that we have out there. So whether it's kind of thinking about like provenance or metadata or watermarking, what are the kind of um, opportunities or risks related to them? And also how might you use a variety of different transparency and disclosure techniques at once? Um, how does that increase um, uh, safety um, as well? So uh, that's one piece. And then the second is um, around our uh, um, synthetic media um, framework, which was released last year. And I think that's important because um, I think Arik mentioned a good point there around sort of literacy. Some of the work in our framework was around the types of steps different actors should take before deploying synthetic content. Um, and I think a key and important part of that framework was also thinking about the different responsibilities of different actors and where those responsibilities might lie. So what should the steps be of uh, a platform versus uh, the uh, model deployers themselves or a synthetic, a downstream kind of synthetic media company. Um, everyone might have different responsibilities and what steps should they all take from a, from a um, disclosure transparency 
kind of testing perspective. So um, yeah, two plugs for some work that we've done, but I think thinking about responsibilities and sometimes they actually require different steps. And then um, also kind of uh, the different mechanisms, the trade-offs and where we are at technically as to what their pros and cons are. Um, and then also, yeah, just applying it to the real world where our baseline wasn't perfect, <laughs> actually, um, and trying to understand um, what the differences are um, as much as possible. There was a, uh, a I was at a, uh, a kind of workshop roundtable recently where the kind of question around content provenance and watermarking and labeling came up. And um, the discussion was really interesting because they were sort of saying that, you know, these technical solutions are absolutely necessary, but they're not sufficient. And until we kind of change our our information ecosystem and the different actors within it and how they kind of you know do we is it about kind of proving that this one piece of information is is true and a sea of false information or or, or vice versa and and kind of maybe the the, the 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 way our information ecosystem is currently set up is not designed to kind of it's not on the side of truth perhaps um but i, I i've got other questions but there are some questions coming in on the chat and i think it's always nicer to um to ask the questions that other people are interested in asking. So one from um, Herbie, who is a researcher at the UK AI Safety Institute, um, kind of says that they spend a lot of time thinking about the expected improvements in AI capabilities over the coming years, which could be uh, lead to potentially significant impact on society and the economy via automation, among other things. So a question for you both is, how do your own personal expectations about future AI development influence your policy and governance thinking looking ahead to the next few years um i think feel free to take some liberties it could be next few years it could be a little bit more beyond maybe give us a a, a view on both in terms of where you think we're headed so it's a really great question and um, the way we try to think about it or the, the, way, the way i try to think about it try, we our team tried to think about it is um to try and project at least sort of 10 20 years into the future and think about what society might look like and what these technologies might look like we've got a project at the moment um, which has just started called um, Digital Assistive Technologies, which is looking at the landscape of um, assistive tech for people with disabilities. One aspect of that project is, um, you know, how can these technologies, first of all, help people with disabilities right now in terms of uh, living fulfilled, independent lives, but also projecting into the future where you have a uh, the digital native population um getting older going going into social care yeah having different expectations of services that they might want to access um or, you know if they get off they uh can disability having access to those same services like internet use gaming um uh, culture etc um and then trying to think about what needs to change between now and 20 years time which is the the more likely um sort of um pace of change that we're, we're going to see considering things like um, development of technologies education standards all this all these things we're talking about um in terms of the broader conversation about ai i mean one thing i've been trying to follow is the conversations on artificial general intelligence which i don't really know where, where that's going and, and our view generally at the world society is you know um to not necessarily disregard um some of these conversations because our fellowship they have different views on that on that same topic if you look if you look at the letter on um pausing the development of ai from from last year you know some of our fellows signed that some of our other fellows think it's a load of nonsense so we, we do try to consider that as well and then thinking about that longer term is 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 really about when those systems are embedded into important decision making systems uh in wider society or in, in our area of interest of the world society is within the scientific um uh process so we have a report coming out next month end of may called science in the age of ai which is looking at um how ai is changing the nature and methods of scientific research and as part of that um we have built on a horizon scanning exercise we did ahead of the ai safety summit where we got scientists from uh disciplines as diverse as astrophysics to paleontology to think about how ai is going to change their field in terms of hypothesis generation peer review academic writing 
impacts on funding, um, data access, things like that. Thinking that in 10, 20 years time, one scenario, for example, could be someone uses AI to generate a hypothesis, uses it to conduct the experiment, perhaps in a different country, then it, maybe they don't need to do it. Maybe there's a fully automated lab somewhere else in the world and they can just type in their experiment and run it. Um, they might write up the paper using AI. Someone who's doing peer review might use AI. Um, what what does that mean for the scientific method, which is based on um, you know, testing, retesting, uh, reproducibility, external scrutiny, if those things are all affected. So we, we do very much try to project uh, quite long term into the future. And, and this is a, a really difficult area to do so. Uh, Arik, on the use of AI for um, uh, kind of scientific research and particularly papers, I don't know if you've uh, uh, kind of seen, I mean, maybe this is just my Twitter threads, but a lot of my Twitter thread is full of people pointing out where like seen, an yeah. academic paper says, you know, sure here are 10 ways and it's you know it's clear that it's they've used an LLM and they've not scrubbed it particularly well I don't know what do, we do when we, what, what do we do when we can't detect that right right <laughs> right, right, how, right how, yeah. how much is already undetected actually yeah true uh, these are really really interesting questions yeah I have seen uh, my Twitter feed is probably very similar to yours Aiden <laughs> <laughs> yeah it probably it, pro it probably is um Steph what are your views on kind of where where, where we're going in the next couple of years yeah, and what the also, policy and governance also things I'm just declaring on YouTube there was a earthquake in new york and i just keep receiving these live alerts like new alert, earthquake alert. so if you see me um looking down or doing things at any point just um apologies audience for that um but no many thoughts on this question i think it's a really really important question and um i think pai just a few things about uh, i'll mention a few things about the way we work uh, and some of the research that we are doing that i think is for me a lot of uh requires a lot of focus um, and informing a lot of my own priorities, just because I think there's an important future proofing point policy um, that should be informing the way we work. So the first is that I think we're lucky we we um, at PAI, each of our research programs and my policy department have steering committees that are made up of um, global experts. And I think we are very lucky that we get to benefit from many of their insights. And so um, these are made up of industry, civil society and academia and the policy uh, steering committee case I have, it's also made up of Senelec from a kind of European standards perspective. And also the OECD sits on our steering committee. And so I think um, in terms of uh, future AI development, I think we do a lot of work turning to them, but also thinking about it from different perspectives and insights. Um, we also have someone who um, is from the Content Moderators Union in Kenya and really thinking about this from a kind of workers um, and labor perspective. Um, we traditionally were thinking about data labeling, um, but one question that I've heard coming up more and more is, um, what's the impact of workers when you try to scale red teaming, for example, <laughs> who's going to do all the red teaming that we, you know, keep talking about as our, as our new favorite term in the, in the policy space. Um, so yeah, we think we benefit and try to bring together people who will bring all those unique insights. And so, yeah, a model that I would definitely encourage others to do and just make sure that we aren't in our silos and really, um, inviting different, um, insights. Um, the second is, yeah, um, across our research program and something that we're paying more attention to on the policy side this year is what are those um, kind of policy tools that I think will need to stand the test of time um, and will be important, potentially regardless of the different types of capabilities that we see. And I think even now, if you're thinking about a narrow purpose model, a frontier model, et cetera, all of them require documentation as one example. Um, what does technical documentation mean? What is, if you define, if there was a definition of like non-technical documentation, uh, what does that look like at what stages of the development life cycle um, should we be thinking about those forms of documentation? Increasingly, who's the audience of that documentation, particularly as we know that policymakers and the institutes or the AI, UK AI Safety Institute, you're probably thinking about um, documentation and the um, outcomes of evals and how you report that. And so um, I think for me, therefore, documentation has been a really important um, priority for me this year, and we'll be doing some work. So kind of stay tuned on that for, for some of PAI's work on that this year, which is building on our About ML project, which was um, benefited from a lot of expertise um, over the years and is, is our a kind of documentation program. 
Um, a second way, just very quickly, that we think about this is also how do we help governments really um, future-proof their approaches? So um, just recently, we um, co-convened um, two listening sessions in the US, which are um, uh, kind of meetings that you can convene to help uh, agencies gather evidence to um, on how they might best deliver their mandates. So in the US, we had the US Executive Order and uh, Department of Commerce and NIST specifically has been tasked with much, a lot of things. Uh, and two of those things is the synthetic content work. So thinking about disclosure, provenance, and the other is the international mandate. How might the US work with other countries on standards, risk management, uh, processes, et cetera. So we had two listening sessions on those two topics. What should this be thinking about in terms of the technical approaches they should be focusing on? Um, what are the potential risks? But how do they future-proof their approaches uh, to engagement in those areas? So um, yeah, those are three things that I think we're very much um, doing at the moment um, and kind of works around the model of how PAI uh, works as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Steph. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of conscious of time, not least, because I think I heard a couple of those Google calendar notifications, which means everyone's got other meetings coming coming up soon. Um, and I, I, there are a few other questions that I wanted to kind of just briefly touch on. I think there's a couple, one from um, uh, Agreema Seth and, and I think Natalie picked up on it as well around this question of, you know, the, when we're looking at this global conversation, it does feel like so much of this is dominated by the UK, US, Europe, and then a lot of it by um, industry organisations or government bodies within those places. Um, and how do we kind of bring in, uh, uh, you know, voices that are beyond the kind of global north or the, the global northwest, I suppose, um, just kind of uh, to, to, to briefly touch on this from the Cohere for AI perspective, we, we have quite a big kind of open science community and a network of researchers around the world. Our scholars program um, has brought in a lot of people who are from global South countries or countries outside of Europe and North America to, to be a part of that because, you know, it's, I, I guess, our small way of trying to um, make sure that the resources and the, the um, routes into machine learning research are there for people from from those underrepresented and underserved backgrounds. And similarly, we released a model, a uh, multilingual model called AYA, which was um, produced with a network of, of again, over 3,000 researchers from over 100 countries. And that brought the capabilities of language models to over 101 languages. So we're, we're, I think this question of kind of global perspectives in the broad conversation around machine learning is is super important and a lot more work is needed to, I think, keep keep bringing that in. Um, I don't know, Arik, Steph, did you want to make any kind of comments on, on, on that point as well? And if that feeds into your work at all? Yeah, no. Completely agree. That's really important, and we we try to do, um, we try to incorporate some global South perspective into our work. Although we're very conscious that the Royal Society is not positioned uh, in a way that would ever be representative of of the the global South. But what you know, a couple of examples. Um, our work on disability. One of our committee members is the CEO of the Assist Tech Foundation in India, and partnering with them, we're hoping to reach a different audience and also gain the perspective of um, people with disabilities in India, you know, the most populous country in the world, um, and assist tech startups in India. Equally, our report on science in the age of AI, we're launching it here, but we're also going to do a launch event with UNESCO. UNESCO is very much plugged into the, the global um, scientific community. So really, the way we, we would approach it is through, through partnerships with others, the Royal Society itself very much represents um or very much slants towards the the uk scientific community although we do have also foreign foreign members uh the the slant is still towards the uk yeah i'll be very very quick on this um yes i think that this is so critical and it's something that um we take very seriously at pai and i think we should all be doing more of um honestly especially when i turn up to forums and I'm like yeah we definitely need more people in the room um so um yeah it's definitely the the right questions to be asking um we are on the G20 task force for AI this year so under the G20 they there's a kind of AI work stream uh, the G20 is being hosted by Brazil this year and we're sitting on um, under the T20 group 
uh, the AI task force. Um, so that's something we're really looking forward to as an opportunity to kind of go beyond the, the G7 countries and think obviously about alignment with G7 and the code of conduct and the Hiroshima process that the G7 put in place, but think about some of the distinct um, needs of G20 countries that also should be factored into um, some of that. Um, we engage with the OECD, but I'm of course um, aware that the OECD doesn't um, cover all countries, although they're doing absolutely fantastic work. Uh, the OECD did, however, just have a dialogue with the African Union that I participated in. So there is increasingly more and more dialogue. Um, but again, I definitely would be a champion for more of this type of engagement. Um, and at PAI, I know I mentioned we do have a global partnership covering many countries, but uh, we have done more and more bilateral engagements with different um, countries. Um, so yeah, looking forward to that. And I know we're short on time, so I won't um, speak more, Aidan, but thanks for asking this important question. I just make a very quick point before my uh, colleagues in the international affairs team probably tell me off. Um, we, we also work with um, the national academies of countries around the world, but this is, again, engagement rather than sort of representation. I completely agree with the point that we need more representation of, of Global South voices in these in these conversations. I, I, I totally agree as well. Um, before before I kind of start moving towards bringing us to a close, because I, I, I did promise I'd, I'd wrap before the end of the hour, not least because it's getting to the end of Arik's day here in, in the UK and also Steph, because of that earthquake you mentioned in New York, I'm sure you want to go and like check stuff is all all right. Um, there was one um, question just around whether the UK has a, a permanent AI leader, for example, like a chief statistical officer. Um, my understanding is there is no chief AI officer. There is a permanent, uh, there is a there is a team within the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology that's the AI directorate focused on this work. Um, there's also the AI Safety Institute, which uh, again, permanent is is always a difficult word to use in the context of British government and politics, but um, it is a a, a full civil service team doing a lot of work in this space and we've got uh, I gather one or two people on the on, on, on the webinar who are part of that team um am I missing anything on that question or Steph no I don't I also don't know I think uh, you're probably more in tune with that uh, the answer to that question than me Aiden <laughs> yeah, I think that's right I, I don't think we have someone permanent it depends how you define permanent I guess we do have um yeah the permanent tax of the departments but I don't think I mean their remit goes way beyond AI so I think you're right Aiden in yeah. we don't have a dedicated person in that way I, I, I know that the um chief scientific advisor to to um the UK government Dame Angela Nathine is is kind of very attentive to AI issues but again her remit is much broader than than, than just AI um, cool. Well, that 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 brings us to the to the uh, I guess more or less time. And I just thank you so much, Arik Steph, for, for for bringing the conversation. I don't know whether it's just because I was part of the like actual panel, but that flew by for me. So I hope it, it similarly flew by for you both and for the audience too. Um, really grateful to you for for all of you in the audience for your questions. Um, and I can see like a few people in the chat. Um, and Arik kindly offering to add on LinkedIn. That's very generous. Um, I think the same goes for, for, for me as well. Um, Steph, I won't make that promise on your behalf. Um, but um, yeah, we we will hopefully run another one of these sessions with some other folks in about a month's time. Be really um, great to see many of you in the chat on that one as well. Keep an eye on our LinkedIn and Twitter when we post about that once we've confirmed the details. But meantime, um, Arik, Steph, thank you so much again. Really appreciate you taking the time and your uh, sharing your thoughts and expertise with us today. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks for having us, Aiden. Take care, everyone. All right. Bye-bye, folks. Bye.